Hi everyone, in this clip we are going to determine the best version of Windows to use with a retro system. In 2001, Microsoft launches Windows XP and three years later updates it with the Service Pack 2. For me this is the version of Windows I usually turn to whenever I build a retro system with components after 2001. But Microsoft released many other operating systems and another popular version is Windows 7 launched in 2009. Today we're going to look at two systems that fit in between Windows XP and Windows 7. The Pentium 4 2.4 was launched on the 6th of May 2002 and the second system comes from AMD and is the Socket 939 Athlon 64X2 4200+, Plus, launched in May 2005. The hardware configurations were not randomly picked. I picked the Pentium 4 as I felt it fitted in between Windows XP updates and it should have its strongest performance with Windows XP. The AMD X2 having 64-bit support and being a dual core should feel more at home with the newer operating system and although for regular tests I would install Windows XP without a second thought, today I feel that this system would be better suited for Windows 7. Let's start with the Pentium 4 and see the rest of the components. The motherboard we are going to use for this project is the ABIT BH7 and this has an Intel 845PE chipset. And it is considered an entry motherboard for the 800MHz frontside bus CPUs. It has an AGP slot but it's only 4x but it has plenty of expansion slots. To the right of the CPU we have three DDR1 slots and lower down we can find two angled IDE connectors. There's also a lonely serial ATA1 connector behind the topmost IDE connector. On the back sides, besides some SMDs in the chipset area, the board is pretty clear. In the backplate area, we have the regular PS2 ports, serial, parallel, optical out, 5.1 audio, 4 USBs and 1 Ethernet. The RAM is made by Corsair, these are 512 megabytes modules and they will allow us to use 2225 latencies. Next we have the video card, an FX 5900 made by MSI. Besides the massive radiator on the front, there's a small radiator on the back that only cools the PCB with the help of a thermal pad. The sound card is by Creative, a Sound Blaster Live CT4620. The hard drive is by Western Digital and it has a 250GB capacity. Now let's assemble the components. The Zellman radiator is already fitted as I had this motherboard in storage and I had to test it before starting the project, as I wasn't sure it was still functioning. After adding the power connectors, I add the graphics card. As you can see it has a rubber band around it, as the fan from the front radiator kept falling down and I only discovered this after I was already halfway done with the tests, right before starting with Windows XP. The last addition is the sound card and the setup is now complete. Now let's look at some information about the system. In order to do this properly, we need programs that will function on every operating system from Windows 98 to Windows 7. And here's the list. The only software that didn't work on Windows 9X was SuperPy and it was replaced with a specific version designed for Windows 98 and Millennium.
Also, cache mem refused to start on Windows 2000. Other than that, we managed to use the same software for all operating systems. For Windows Vista and 7, since they exhibit high hard drive usage, after restart, we waited for about 5 minutes until the hard drive activity would settle down and then we would run the tests. Let's see the results for the synthetic tests. I've highlighted in blue the Windows XP results as this will be our baseline. Also highlighted in green are the highest results for a specific test. SuperPy is the only software that requires another version for Windows 9X and it was rather slow for these two operating systems, so we can probably ignore these two results. Vista manages an impressive result for the 1 MB calculation of SuperPy and is closely followed by Windows 7 with Windows XP coming in third. We could calculate and analyze each individual benchmark, but I decided to see the overall result, so I summed up all the columns and calculate a percent based on the value from Windows XP. We can see that for this system, Windows 98 and Millennium are 9 and 6% slower than Windows XP. Windows 7 is just 0.5% faster, while Vista is the real surprise here, being 1.4% faster than Windows XP. This is a result I wasn't expecting. So what happened here? Having a quick look at the results, it looks like all the tests involving the memory had better results under Vista or 7. Let's look at a more obscure program, CacheMem, that measures the CPU cache speed and also the memory speed. And it is obvious here that there is a big difference in favor of Vista and 7. This can be explained that either Windows XP is somehow limiting the memory transfer rates or the newer operating systems have better memory management. Let's move to the graphics tests and here as well we have two sections. We will start with the benchmark section where we apply the same algorithm and find that Vista is 0.5% faster, Windows 7 is 2% slower. We can see that the Windows 9X are on average 15% slower and Windows 2000 is almost 10%. Finally, we will move to the Games section, where Windows 7 picks up its pace and delivers almost 5% more than Windows XP. Windows Millennium is not exactly 30% slower in games. I only managed to start Unreal Gold in software mode, and hence the lower frame rate and the lower overall score. To conclude this section, Windows 7 is marginally better than Windows XP on the Pentium 4. If you have Windows XP installed on a similar build, there's no real need to move to Windows 7, but it's good to know that 7 offers similar performance and some better memory bandwidth. The other versions of Windows aren't a bad choice either, with Windows 98 and Millennium having less than a 10% performance loss. The benchmarks across all operating systems were very smooth and everything was as anticipated, except for Windows Millennium, that confirmed all the jokes going around the internet about it. It even added DOS names for my folders that made exploring them very slow with later operating systems. Our second system for this clip is the ABIT AV8. We start with the CPU, the Athlon 64 X2, the first dual core from AMD. This is the 4200 Plus. Then we move to the motherboard. As we can see, the Northbridge radiator was changed with a Zalman radiator. Centrally positioned we find the 939 socket and to the right there are four memory slots supporting dual channel. We have two angled IDE connectors and two serial ATA connectors. There's one AGP 8X slot and five PCI slots. In the backplate area we find the PS2 connectors, serial, parallel, optical out, four audio channels, four USBs, one Firewire and one Ethernet port. Next we have the memory modules by Corsair. These are the XMS 3500, capable of running at 438 MHz with two free to six latencies. The modules are one gigabyte capacity each. The video card is by Albertron, and it's a 6600 GT. We have the same sound card, Creative Sound Blaster Live, 
We are also going to use the same hard drive, the Western Digital 250GB. Since this is the ABIT AV8 fur die, we have an interesting gadget that connects with a cable to the motherboard and provides some interesting information about the processor and the motherboard. Now let's assemble the system. The CPU is easily fitted to the motherboard. For this project we're going to use the Saiti Mugen 2 radiator that I used for several years with my first Core i7. It's a pretty big and heavy radiator and in order to fit it to the motherboard we're going to have to turn everything around and fit the motherboard onto the radiator. Now let's assemble everything onto the bench table. Fitting of the fan is a bit tricky, as the radiator barely clears the RAM. We continue with the video card and the sound card. We also add the connector for the third eye and connect it. I find this gadget useful when overclocking. And now let's see some information about the system. Into the BIOS by default, this motherboard starts with a 204 frontside bus, which is 4 more than the default. This should account for some increased scores in the benchmarks for whomever does not pay attention to the frontside bus. I find this a pretty low move by ABIT that once produced excellent boards and its name was synonym with overclock. Fortunately we can run the board with 200 MHz frontside bus. We will calculate the percentages the same way we did for the Pentium 4 and here's the result of the synthetic tests. This time I completely ignored Windows Millennium as it messed up the file names last time. Overall Windows XP gets the best results, but all of the other operating systems are really close, all of them being under 5%. In terms of memory, Memcache shows the same pattern with extra score for Windows Vista and 7. Moving to the graphics benchmarks, as you can see I had a hard time getting Windows 98 and Vista to cooperate. Windows 2000 managed to complete all the tests, but Windows 7 shows some lower score across all the benchmarks and the situation for the games isn't much better. So what happened here? Why the almost 30% drop in the graphics tests while the synthetic tests are just as expected? I suspected the drivers, but after changing several versions, the result didn't vary too much. Even the benchmarks for the games were in tone with 3 Mark and had 30% drops on Windows 7. Because the graphics benchmarking process failed several times for the AV8, and the motherboard had over 16,000 power on hours, and I have to admit that this is the first time I'm benchmarking the VIA K8 T800 Pro chipset, I decided to replace it altogether with a motherboard fitted with the Enforce 3 chipset that I'm better acquainted with. We have the same CPU. The DFI Enforce 3 Ultra D motherboard has a different layout with the RAM positioned north of the CPU socket and again we have an AGP 8x slot and 5 PCIs. The only regret I have for this motherboard is that there are no angled IDE or floppy connectors, but we have an additional two serial ATA ports. In the backplate area, the DFI LAN Party Ultra D has the PS2 ports, two coaxial, a parallel, a serial, 4 USBs, 1 Firewire, 1 Ethernet and 3 channel audio. The rest of the parts are identical as for the ABIT AV8. Let's start the assembly process. 
And since we're going to use the same radiator, we're going to have to repeat the process of mounting the motherboard onto the radiator. Now let's fit the rest of the components. Let's see the system information and start the benchmarks. Before we see the results and get disappointed by the DFI under Windows 7 as well, we had two different systems going through so many operating systems and graphics benchmarks. I couldn't pass the opportunity to actually test how Fraps and MSI's Afterburner affect the graphics benchmarks and games. I have to mention that Afterburner works only for Windows XP, Vista and 7. Let's see the results for the Pentium 4. Under Windows 9X, we were able to run Fraps 1.9 and the penalty is mostly negligible. All the tests come under 4%. It's Unreal Gold that has a penalty of 4.3% and 3 Mark 99 that has almost 10% less in the CPU score. Windows Millennium is atypical with these tests as almost half of them get a better score when ran with Fraps on. The biggest drop is 4.5% in 3 Mark 99. We move to Windows 2000 and here we can really say that the difference is negligible and we have only 3% loss in 3 Mark 99 and 4% loss in 3 Mark 2000. Under Windows XP, Fraps shows an 8% drop for Unreal and 3% for 3 Mark 2001. And then we move to MSI's Afterburner and we get a very strange case of a high increase of the score for Aquamark 3 in the graphics section that will be carried over to Vista and Windows 7. Unreal gets a big drop of 30% in the frame rate and also 3D Mark 99 and 2000. I think that 3D Mark 2001 would see a similar drop, but I was forced to run Afterburner in logging mode only without the on-screen display as it would crash the benchmark after the first test. Other than these, the general rule is that Afterburner usually doubles the frame rate loss of Fraps. For Vista, there's nothing really worth mentioning under the Fraps section, but Afterburner shows the same odd behavior for Aquamark 3. Like Windows XP, Unreal sees some big drop in frames per second, and the 3D Mark drops are pretty similar to what happened under Windows XP. The last operating system for this hardware is Windows 7, with the same increase in frames per second in Aquamark 3 and similar drops for 3 Mark and Unreal Gold. Let's move to the ABIT AV8 and see how a dual core handles the frame counting applications. Under Windows 2000, the 3 Marks show a 6% drop and Unreal a 4% drop. All the other benchmarks or games are under 1%. And the results are carried over to Windows XP with even smaller differences for 3 Mark and Unreal. But Afterburner takes a lot more resources and the 3 Mark software jumps to around 35% and Unreal Gold to 28%. Windows Vista and 7 both created various issues with the benchmarks and the games and many tests failed before completing. We jump over to DFI's benchmarks, this time only for Windows XP and we get very similar percentages to the ABIT AV8, with the exceptions of 3 Mark 99 that this time with Fraps active we almost double the score getting a very high score. We jump over to Afterburner and as usual 3D Mark loses more than a third of the frames per second and also Unreal Gold loses 28.5%. Before we have the conclusion of today's side quest and since we have a dual core CPU in the comparison there's no way we can let this go without playing the Affinity game, sending fraps to one core and the benchmark to another. Unfortunately I only ran this on the ABIT AV8 
for Windows XP and Fraps, since I already gathered many results from the other tests and adding affinity scores would have only made things more complex. In the Windows XP column, we have the regular Fraps tests, which we will consider to be 100%, and in the Windows XP affinity column, we have the results with Fraps on one core and 3 Mark on another. The differences are negligible, but in many cases we can see a very slight improvement of the score when using Affinity. For me this is not too surprising, and I consider this to be the real price we pay when using a frames per second counter in a game. So where are we losing the rest of the frames? Some 3 Mark tests show the 5% loss. My conclusion is that it deals with the way 3 Mark interprets the pixels that are displayed by fraps on the screen. And this goes the other way as well, as Aquamark 3 registered some increased scores when using Afterburner. For this one I think if there's a section of the benchmark that displays 10 frames per second and Afterburner updates the section with the CPU display faster than 10 times a second, then the benchmark software will detect some pixel changes and will add some extra frames to the counter. Overall, after all these tests and ignoring the odd behavior of Aquamark 3 for the Pentium 4, we can say that when you play a game, Fraps makes you lose 2% tops for the section we tested. And when it comes to games, the OpenGL ones are less prone to a drop when using a frames per second counter than the DirectX ones. When you are using Afterburner to get the basic information, the lost frames almost double in percent from Fraps. For the benchmarks, there's no need to have Fraps or Afterburner running in the background as they have their own counter. But if you do, then you should expect about 5 to 6% loss for Fraps and up to 30% loss in Afterburner. Like Aquamark 3, Unreal Gold's benchmark stands out having a 30% drop like 3 Mark when using Afterburner. Also playing with the Affinity does bring about some minor improvements, but I'm not sure it's worth bothering with. So don't benchmark with Fraps or Afterburner. Use them only when gaming and in order to evaluate graphic busy levels or drivers. Before we started the frames per second side quest, we assembled the DFI, but the Enforce 3 motherboard was never intended for this clip, so we're not going to pass it through all the tests on all operating systems. We're only going to compare Windows XP and Windows 7. And the synthetic tests are no surprise at all. The only surprise this time is that the memory tests are a lot closer than what we had for the A-bit. Moving on to cache mem, we see that big cache difference this time with 50% extra for Windows 7. But the real reason we did this was for the graphics tests. And Windows 7 refuses to run 3 Mark 99. But for the remaining tests, there's also an almost 18% difference in favor of Windows XP. Going to the game's benchmarks, some tests refuse to run on Windows 7, and I consider them bringing 0 frames per second, and the difference is huge. But for the tests that did run, we get a difference of 20 to 30%, which puts us in line with the ABIT AV8. So what's wrong with the graphics tests for Socket 939 on Windows 7? From what I dug up on Vogons and NVIDIA's forums, the answer is as follows. NVIDIA has determined that the issue is specific to Enforce 3 based systems, utilizing AMD Athlon X2 dual core CPUs and running Microsoft Vista. The NVIDIA Enforce 3 core logic predates multi-core CPUs and was not designed to support them. At this time the only known solutions to this issue under Microsoft Vista is to use a single core processor or to upgrade to a newer motherboard platform. Further down it reads, if the system contains an AGP motherboard with an unsupported chipset for Vista, the AGP card will operate in PCI mode only. AMD's AGP adapters require correctly functioning AGP support from the operating system in order to run the WDDM driver under Vista. This WDDM driver has no way of working around the absence of AGP support. I'm not sure we had the same issue for the ABIT AV8 and its VIA chipset, but the drivers were installed and the graphics card functioned properly and still we had a 20 to 30% drop in frame rate under Vista or 7, the same like the DFI Ultra D. In the end, this is a known issue for the Enforce 3 chipset under Windows 7 that defaults the AGP card to a PCI bus when using a dual-core CPU.
with a drop of 20% as other users described the issue. So while looking very promising, the Athlon X2 ended up with better results and compatibility on the older Windows XP. I started this test convinced that the Pentium 4 would be better suited for Windows XP, but I was wrong and Windows 7 was the winner. Also the Athlon X2 was an ideal candidate for Windows 7 until we reached the graphics section. We ended up with the opposite conclusions to what we set out to achieve. But time was not lost. If you are into retro software that for some strange reason is not a game, I think that any system with a CPU that came after 2003 and 1 GB of memory or more is a better match for Windows 7 to get those old Excel spreadsheets rolling. Talking about games, the same conclusion should apply, but sometimes the drivers get in the way. Today the Pentium 4 had better game results under Windows 7, making it the ideal operating system in every category for Intel's processor. But the Athlon X2 had better gaming results under Windows XP. In Windows 7, we had issues due to the drivers and the adoption of older chipsets to newer CPUs, like the Dual Core X2, in order to keep older connectors around, like the AGP port. In the end I can't fully recommend switching to Windows 7, as sometimes it seems sluggish, and the fact that you have to wait 5 minutes for the hard drive activity to subside before starting anything is a bother. But Windows 7 is a rather modern operating system, and you can still use modern browsers, also its compatibility mode is decent. On the other hand Windows XP is out of date, but it has the best retro hardware compatibility. Still it's been a long time since the supported browsers have been updated and I would consider this a major security risk and not go on the internet with it. Since we used hardware that predates Windows 7 by 4 respectively 7 years and still got benchmark results that are very close to XP, I think that speaks a lot for the effort Microsoft had put into Windows 7's compatibility. Speaking for myself, when an AGP slot and card are involved, I'm not yet ready to move from Windows XP to Windows 7. This opens a new opportunity to continue this series with the investigation of the early PCI Express motherboards. We will continue with the Enforce 4 chipset for the same Athlon 64X2 processor as we need to root out the graphics issue we had for Windows 7. We will also add a compatible motherboard for the Pentium D. Thank you for watching and see you next time.